we'd like to welcome those that are joining to our HOP Summer Research Seminar Series for those that may be joining for the first time. Um, my name is Vicki Bowden and I am a project manager here at HOP. Um, today, we're excited to um, welcome you all to our next um, lecture series. So just to provide format for today, um, we I'll share some introductory remarks, then we will um, have our speaker and at the close we'll offer a time for q a and as a reminder all of the q a um, any questions that you have please use our q a feature rather than um, the chat function the q a feature will help us um, be certain that we address those questions submitted there and today, um, I am so excited to have Dr. Santosh Rodana um, speaking with you all. He, the title of his talk is Just Desserts, How Cellular Metabolism Affects Cancer and Immu Immune Cell Function. So um, just to share a bit about Dr. Vardana's um, background, he is a medical oncologist where he specializes in caring for people with lymphomas, which is a form of blood cancer. Um, as a researcher, he studies how understanding the metabolic behavior of immune cells can improve immunotherapies for human cancers. His research um, has identified alterations in cellular metabolism that contribute to immune dysfunction and cancer cell survival in tumors and viral infections. Um, Dr. Vardana completed his training, his doctorate in immunology at NYU School of Medicine in 2009. Um, after um, that, he earned his medical degree there as well in 2011. After completing his residency um, in internal medicine at New York Presbyterian in 20, 2013, he joined MSK's lymphoma service while pursuing a postdoc fellowship in the laboratory of Dr. Kremp Thompson, which he completed in 2020. He currently runs a lab as part of MSK's HOP um, department. Again, thank you so much. We're so excited to have you um, with us, Dr. Vardana. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen and you can take it away. Thanks again. Well, um, thank you very much, Vicki, for the kind introduction. And um, thanks to everybody who's um, attending this lecture for the opportunity to talk about this very interesting topic, um, which is essentially the intersection of cellular metabolism, um, immune responses, and cancer, all subjects that are quite near and dear to my heart. Um, so I thought a nice place to start would be to introduce the idea of cellular metabolism and talk a little bit about why that's something that we find interesting. So if we take kind of a step back and we think about what is cellular metabolism, I'm sure, you know, many of the people uh, watching this seminar can kind of think back to their you know, chemistry or biochemistry classes, and think about these kind of complicated enzymatic processes that, um, that you study within cells. You know, cellular metabolism is a very, is a very complex phenomenon that involves a lot of, you know, um, um, interrelated processes. But one way to kind of globally think about it is to think about cellular metabolism as any, uh, or an accumulation of any sets of chemical reactions that allow cells to acquire or utilize substrates for biological processes. A simpler way to think about this would say, you know, cellular metabolism refers to how cells get what they need in order to make what they need. So how can we kind of categorize this into smaller groups to help understand it a little bit more easily? Well, I like to kind of compartmentalize this into kind of two major sets of metabolic behaviors. One is what we think of as catabolic metabolism. And this is actually most of what people learn in both their high school and college biochemistry classes, which is the idea that metabolism refers to taking up nutrients from the extracellular space and breaking it down to make smaller things. And in particular, utilizing the breakdown of those macromolecules to make energy in the form of ATP. And 
indeed, that is a very important aspect of cellular metabolism, but it's also important to remember that cells also have to do something very different metabolically under different circumstances, which is what we think of as anabolic metabolism. So this refers to the idea of taking smaller pieces, build, building blocks or energy or free electrons, and using that to generate larger molecules for different purposes, whether it's for a cell to proliferate or make proteins that it secretes into the extracellular environment or make lipids to make new plasma membranes. These are all versions of anabolic metabolism. So you can see that there's these kind of like yin and yang to cellular metabolism, where sometimes you're breaking down stuff and sometimes you're building up stuff, which begs the question, how do cells decide what type of metabolism they want to engage in? Well, the answer to that question really differs based on what type of organism you're talking about. So if we start on the most simple level and we think about unicellular organisms like yeast, in unicellular organisms, growth is pretty much dictated by nutrient availability. So if you have a substrate around that you're going to grow on, that you can grow on in your unicellular organism, you use it. And the way you use it depends on what the extracellular environment is. Yeast is a great way to understand this because a lot of people are familiar with what yeast does. So if you expose yeast to sugar and there is oxygen present, uh, they, uh, the yeast will break down that sugar within their mitochondria and generate carbon dioxide. Um, I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with that because the release of gas allows dough to rise and form bread. What happens if yeast have sugar available to them, but they start to run out of oxygen? Well, then they convert to a different form of metabolism known as anaerobic uh, metabolism in which they will ferment the available sugar and usually produce ethanol from it. For those of you who are unfamiliar with it, that's the process by which fermentation produces alcohol. And finally, if uh, nutrients in the form of sugar are unavailable to yeast, they will undergo a uh, mating type switch and undergo meiosis and eventually uh, sporulate as a way of protecting themselves in the setting of uh, lack of nutrient availability. So this is just to kind of illustrate that the primary driver of what a single celled organism does is how much nutrients and what type of nutrients are available to them in the environment. And they will grow as long as there are sufficient substrates that enable them to grow. And the other important thing to know about unicellular organisms is that they will sense the nutrients that are available to them and they will change their gene expression in order to maximally utilize those nutrients. So one canonical example of this is the lac operon in E. coli type of bacteria. So if E. coli are presented exclusively with lactose, a milk sugar, as a way to uh, grow, the presence of a metabolite of that lactose will actually then change the way genes are expressed in the cell, and it will signal to the cell that they should start expressing genes that allow them to break down lactose. So even in these single cell organisms, you can see that the availability of nutrients in the extracellular environment informs what the cell does, suggesting that cellular metabolism is really coupled to cellular behavior in a very intricate fashion. That actually gets quite a bit more complicated when you think about multicellular organisms like you know, animals or people, right? So if you could imagine, it would be a very bad idea in multicellular organisms if the only thing that drove whether a cell grew or not was whether nutrients were present. Because you know, that would mean that every time we eat a meal, all the cells in our body start growing and we actually don't want that to happen, right? If you're a multicellular organism with lots of different cells and lots of different tissues, growth needs to be tightly controlled and heavily regulated. Cells should not grow when nutrients are merely available, but actually only grow when you need cells to grow and you need particular cells to grow. And the way that's coordinated in multicellular organisms is to have some sort of centralized control in the version of a factor that's secreted and will tell certain cell types to grow when they need to. And the hallmark for this is insulin, which I'm sure everybody listening to this is familiar with, right? So 
Insulin is something, it is a, a hormone that your body produces, cells in your body produce in response to an increase in the level of sugar in your blood. In response to that uh, stimulus, the secreted insulin then tells specific cells in your body to take up that sugar and either utilize it or store it. And the way that that works is through growth factor receptor signaling. So insulin is a soluble molecule. It binds to an insulin receptor that initiates a signal transduction cascade. And the result is that a transporter that allows glucose to enter the cell, but was previously on the inside of the cell, is now moved to the outside or the cell surface so that glucose can now enter. So this is essentially how multicellular organisms coordinate growth under appropriate conditions, that in response to a particular stimulus, a central coordinator will then mediate the way that nutrients are taken up and stimulate growth in different tissues. And a prime example of how that occurs is what happens when you are not able to produce insulin, right? So that's something called uh, type one diabetes. So what happens in that situation? You have high blood sugar, but your pancreas can't produce insulin. So interestingly, you have this weird paradox where your body has lots of sugar, but your brain thinks you're starving and your liver thinks you're starving because there's no insulin to tell those cells to take up glucose. So your fat cells and your liver starts producing alternative substrates as backup fuel to help your brain survive in the form of keto acids, even though you actually have plenty of sugar around that your brain could use, it's not using it because it's not getting the growth factor signal. So that's a key element for um, me to communicate to you guys, which is that in non-transformed cells, nutrient uptake is regulated by growth factors. And if a growth factor isn't present, Cells in a multicellular organism will not take up nutrients, even if they're present. So one aspect of this, if you really want to be able to coordinate having different cells in your body grow at appropriate times, is that those growth factors have to be tissue specific, right? Because you don't just want to say, well, we have one hormone that we release into the body and then all the cells in the body grow. No, you might want to have specific situations in which you want to make more blood cells or more hair cells or more liver cells or more skin cells. And so the way that multicellular organisms achieve that is with tissue specific growth factors. And so in order to have um, uh, cellular proliferation in a multicellular organism, you essentially need those two things. You need a tissue specific growth factor, and you need to have a cell that lives in that tissue that actually can proliferate. That cell is commonly known as a stem cell, which is a cell that's capable of self-renewing or giving rise to more of itself, but also giving rise to other cells. So you can see four examples of that on the right, where you have tissue-specific stem cells in the connective tissue or the liver or the hair follicle or the hematopoietic system. These are all areas where in specific circumstances in your skin, if you get a cut in a liver, if you have to you know, donate part of your liver or resect part of your liver in your hair with, you know, your hair is growing all the time and your hematopoietic system, which turns over routinely, those are all settings in which you actually need to give rise to more cells at some routine interval. And that is driven by a set sets of distinct growth factors that when called upon will tell those stem cells to proliferate. So one interesting thing about this chart is that while these growth factors seem to stimulate proliferation, they also seem to stimulate something else, which is what we call differentiation, the process by which a progenitor cell changes into its terminal fate. So an epithelial or connective tissue stem cell is ultimately going to become a skin cell or a cell that lines a blood vessel called an endothelial cell. A liver stem cell is going to become a hepatocyte, a, a follicular, hair follicular stem cell is going to become hair, and um, your hematopoietic stem cells are going to become neutrophils or other components of the blood. Which raises the question, why in multicellular organisms do these growth factor stimuli not only tell cells to proliferate, but also tells them to turn into a differentiated counterpart? And the reason for that is to prevent the problem of uncontrolled proliferation in multicellular organisms. So you can imagine if you have a growth factor for a certain cell type and that growth factor is present, it's going to tell one cell to become many cells, as I show on the right. But like 
if that is unchecked, those cells will continue proliferating without stopping. And you can only imagine some of the negative consequences of that process. So one way that multicellular organisms limit the capacity of cells to keep proliferating, thereby preventing cell overgrowth, is by ensuring that cell growth is coupled to proliferation. So as a growth factor stimulates cells to make more cells, it's also telling them to reach the natural end of their lifespan in which they'll become a terminally differentiated cell with a cell function. And this process of differentiation, much like the process of proliferation, is also regulated by cellular metabolites. So when you have a growth factor stimulus that tells a cell to take up nutrients, the nutrients that that cell takes up certainly allows it to generate the building blocks so that the cells can keep growing, but byproducts of those nutrients that are taken up uh, actually translocate into the nucleus and change the accessibility of your DNA so that the cell starts expressing genes that tell it to turn into an, uh, a separate cell type. So for example, for a progenitor cell to turn into a fat cell or an adipocyte in this diagram. So if we sort of synthesize those two things together, we would say that in multicellular organisms, growth factors secreted by your body tell cells when called upon to proliferate, but also to differentiate so that they can become the terminal cell types that are needed for the body to perform in a homeostatic fashion. So how does this relate to cancer? So the best way to start talking about that is to talk about this phenomenon called the Warburg effect, which is um, pretty much the phenomenon that really sort of reinvigorated the field of cancer metabolism or thinking about how cellular metabolism can contribute to cancer. And uh, this discovery was made by Otto Warburg, a German physiologist who actually accomplished a number of things and was nominated for the Nobel Prize many, many times and eventually received the Nobel Prize. And amongst his many discoveries was this odd finding in which he took animal tumors and uh, including human tumors and breast cancer tumors and took, their, took slices of breast cancer tissue and normal breast tissue and observed what they did when he grew them in a dish. Um, and what he expected to see was what we expect most eukaryotic cells to do, which is as long as oxygen is present, the cells will take up glucose and convert it to carbon dioxide uh, through the mitochondria um, and thereby generating 36 molecules of ATP per molecule of glucose. That's something that you guys probably all learned in high school, which is that this is kind of part of the evolution of eukaryotic cells is the ability to maximally extract ATP from glucose. And that if oxygen was not present, then they would the cells would revert to kind of like a more archaic prokaryotic form of metabolism in which they would, you know, ferment the available glucose to produce lactate in this case. Um, uh, and that would allow them to generate two molecules of ATP per molecule of glucose. But that's obviously very inefficient and would never happen if sufficient oxygen were present to get maximal ATP extraction from a single molecule of glucose. But instead, he found something really odd, which is that tumors were preferring to excrete glucose as lactate, even though plenty of oxygen was present. So they were kind of engaging in this archaic or evolutionarily like throwback form of metabolism, even though they had mitochondria and could, you know, presumably participate in uh, mitochondrial metabolism and get much more ATP out of each molecule of glucose. And actually, when uh, Dr. Warburg described this phenomenon, he concluded that this must mean that the mitochondria of tumors are dysfunctional in some way, because no cell would ever really choose to engage in this inefficient form of metabolism if a more efficient form of metabolism were possible. And it was only about like 15 years ago that um, a number of scientists, including our very own uh, Craig Thompson, uh, the president and CEO of MSKCC, um, realized that this switch to a uh, uh, glycolytic metabolism rather than mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation was not an accident due to damaged mitochondria, but actually a purposeful change on the part of proliferating cells. And the way he figured this out was essentially to kind of pretty simple math experiment. So like, let's say your cell 
and you want to proliferate. Well, if you want to proliferate, remember we said you're going to engage in kind of an anabolic metabolism. So what you really need to do is make stuff. So let's take an exam. You need to make like twice the amount of stuff, right? If you're going to go from one cell to two cells, you need to double all the stuff in your cell. So let's take an example of one to make. You need to make lipids so that you can make a new plasma membrane to make um, a new cell. So one example of a lipid that you might want to make is palmitate. So if you wanted to make one molecule of palmitate, what would you need? So simply count up what we would need by going through all those synthetic reactions. So it turns out that you need quite a bit of carbon. You need 16 carbons that could come from glycolysis in the form of acetyl-CoA, so eight molecules of acetyl-CoA. You actually need a number of electrons in order to put those carbon substrates together, and that is generated in the form of NADPH. And you do need some ATP to power these reactions. But interestingly, if you look at the amount of ATP that you need compared to the amount of acetyl-CoA or electrons you need, you really don't need that much ATP to engage in this synthetic process. And then if you just look at the different ways that you could use glucose, it's true that you get 36 ATP if you oxidize all that glucose in the mitochondria. But in order to get those 36 ATP, you completely break down your carbon into carbon dioxide that's then like lost from the cell. And you also don't generate any electrons. So you're generating all of this ATP, but you're not generating any of the building blocks that you actually need to make these macromolecules. And because of that, it actually turns out um, that it's more efficient for cells that want to make stuff to engage in glycolysis, which is true, don't generate as much ATP, but if you put glucose into a separate pathway called the, either the pentose phosphate pathway or just engage in glycolysis, you'll be able to make all of these different building blocks, which is actually more efficient for cells to engage in proliferation. The other issue if you're a cell that's trying to grow very quickly is that the reactions in the mitochondria go quite a bit more slowly than the early glycolytic reactions that break down glucose. So that means that if you're going to try to um, fully oxidize all of your glucose in the mitochondria, your reactions are going to be going like quite a bit slower than they could otherwise. And finally, you really don't want to make too much ATP in a cell because your cells sense the presence of ATP. And when they sense that those energy bins are full, they tell the cell to stop taking up any more glucose. So you really don't want to make more ATP than you need. So it turns out because of all of this, that the best way to proliferate is to not use your mitochondria that much, not overwhelm your cell with that much ATP, and actually use glycolysis as a way to turn over glucose really, really quickly and turn them into these intermediate building blocks that you can then turn into nucleotides um, um, and proteins in order to engage in cellular proliferation. So it turns out that this metabolic shift to engage in aerobic glycolysis is really a hallmark of all proliferating cells, and that includes cancer cells, which begs the question, how does cancer activate aerobic glycolysis in order to proliferate? Well, it turns out that if you study the way that insulin works in your body, one of the ways that insulin uh, works in your body, as, we, as I mentioned before, is by initiating this signaling cascade. And um, this signaling cascade is um, a pathway known as the PI3 kinase pathway. And if you look at what genes are mutated in human cancer, it turns out that essentially the most frequently mutated family of genes, the most frequently like constitutively turned on pathway in tumors is this PI3 kinase pathway. And what that accomplishes for cancer cells is it liberates them from the need to get any extracellular signals in order to drive glucose uptake. So you get these constitutively active members of these pathways so cancer cells just continuously take up glucose, whether anybody is telling them to or not. In that way, they're almost behaving more like unicellular organisms. As long as there's sugar there, the cells are going to take up as much as they can in order to grow as much as possible. And that can be leveraged for a really interesting purpose, which is that you can take a modified radioactive version of glucose, um, an 18-fluorine uh, labeled version of glucose, 
and you can inject it into the bloodstream of, say, a patient. And you can ask which cells are going to take up this radio-labeled version of glucose the most. And it turns out that cells that are rapidly proliferating, that are engaging in aerobic glycolysis, are going to take up lots and lots of glucose and are therefore going to take up lots and lots of this radioactive tracer. And that is the basis for what is known as um, positron emission tomography or PET scans and our use of PET scans, particularly in oncology, to see how active cancers are. So because cancers are rapidly engaging in aerobic glycolysis, they are taking up tons of glucose. And when you feed, when, when you inject a patient with a labeled version of glucose to trace where it's going, it's gonna go mostly where the tumors are. And it's a good way of localizing where tumors are located, which helps us stage patients. And it also gives us a lot of information about treatment responses, because you'll see that signal go away when the patients are successfully treated. So one other thing to mention about cancer cells, and this is the last thing that I'll mention about cancer before talking about the immune system, is that if you'll remember when I was talking about non-transformed cells, I mentioned that growth factors stimulate cells to proliferate, but part of the reason those cells don't keep proliferating and turn into cancer is because they differentiate and eventually they turn into a cell that can't proliferate anymore. So in multicellular organisms, growth factor dependent proliferation is limited in part by terminal differentiation. So even if a cancer cell turned on aerobic glycolysis and just started taking up glucose continuously, if all the other parts of the cell were functioning normally, eventually, let's say a hematopoietic cell, it might start growing really quickly, but then it would eventually just turn into a neutrophil and stop growing. So you would never really get cancer because you would just kind of get a burst of proliferation that stops when the cell differentiates. But it turns out that oftentimes the companion change or mutation in uh, cancer cells that occur as they're developing is to block that path of terminal differentiation. So it's these two changes working together that actually enable cancer to occur. Uh, uh, change in the cancer cell that enables it to continuously take up nutrients without being told, and also some sort of genetic change that tells the cell not to differentiate. So either expressing a transcription factor that reinforces some sort of stem-like program, changes in the enzymes that modify chromatin, which is going to affect the genes that are expressed by the cell globally. And it turns out even changes in metabolism, because many of the changes that um, occur in chromatin are just the attachment or removal of small molecules that are actually metabolites that come from the extracellular space. So to conclude kind of the first half, um, unicellular organisms, in unicellular organisms, growth is pretty much regulated by nutrient availability. As long as a nutrient is available, a unicellular organism will grow. In multicellular organisms, growth is controlled by growth factor signaling, but is limited by terminal differentiation. And therefore, in a multicellular organism, if cancer is going to develop, it requires two things, activation of growth factor independent nutrient uptake and blockade of growth factor di driven differentiation. So let's move on to talk a little bit about the immune system. So what is the immune system? It's obviously something that's only present in multicellular organisms because it's a specific uh, cell type that's part of a greater organism. The immune system in some fundamental way exists to defend your body against anything that does not belong in your body, what we would refer to as non-self. And in some global way, we can break the immune response down into kind of like two large pieces. One is the innate immune response and the other is the adaptive immune response. The innate immune response is kind of designed to be your first pass protector. So you have certain uh, uh, cells in your body that are capable of recognizing preset foreign elements that your body kind of knows is bad. So DNA or RNA that kind of is only present in viruses, but not in regular people or components of bacterial cell walls that are not normally present in a human being. You have a certain set of cells that can recognize those specific patterns and initiate an immune response. 
but that's really not enough to protect you against any theoretical invader. And your immune system really wants to be able to flexibly defend you against anything that could be attacking you. And so your adaptive immune system helps you accomplish that. And so your adaptive immune system is driven by a number of cell types, but in particular, two cell types called your B cells and T cells. Those are um, uh, part of a cell type called uh, lymphocytes. And those cells express a specific receptor um, called a B cell receptor for B cells and a T cell receptor for T cells. And in your bone marrow, and then eventually in a second organ for T cells called your thymus, you generate millions and millions and millions of different kinds of B cells and T cells, each with their unique and individual unique B or T cell receptor. The idea being that these cells could theoretically recognize anything that doesn't belong in your body with a specific receptor governed to that particular signal. Um, and so that response takes a little longer to act than your innate immune response, but at least in theory, it gives you two things. It gives you very specific protection against a foreign entity, and it gives you long lived protection against a certain entity uh, in the form of immunological memory, which is why we get vaccinated in order to generate long lived B and T cells that will then protect you if you ever see that infectious agent a second time. It's important to remember when discussing the immune system that, um, you know, immune cells are amongst the most potentially toxic cells in your body. So your immune system is defending your body against pathogens at the cost of tissue damage and destruction. And if this balance is out of whack, you can get a number of problems like autoimmune disease, where your immune system is accidentally recognizing your own tissue as foreign and engaging in tissue destruction. Like if it's attacking your joints and you get something like rheumatoid arthritis, or if it is attacking the cells in your body that produce insulin and therefore you become a type one di diabetic. So you have this incredibly potent immune cell. It also has the capacity to, to destroy your own body. So how do we kind of keep your immune cell from lo losing its potency, but also keep your immune system from destroying your own body? You basically construct a system that allows for both rapid initiation and termination of immune responses. So that way, once you get enough of a foreign signal, you can rapidly ramp up your immune system to clear that infectious agent and then rapidly ramp down so you don't engage in tissue destruction. As I mentioned, this has to be carefully regulated because if you don't ramp up enough, then the bug could persist. And obviously, as you know, from people who have gotten infections, like a persistent bacterial infection is potentially lethal. On the other hand, you don't want to ramp up too much because you don't want to kill the host in the process of trying to kill the foreign agent. Um, one great example of this is actually the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, where a number of researchers realized that a big part of why patients die, at least uh, particularly early on uh, during a COVID-19 infection, is that the immune response to COVID-19 is so potent that it actually damages and destroys the lungs and keeps patients from being able to breathe before they can even really recover from the infectious process. So myself and a lot of many, many, many other people try to study immune responses to understand how um, immune responses are regulated to achieve this, um, achieve this outcome. And one of the many techni techniques that we use is something called flow cytometry. So the immune system is an incredibly complex system. It has hundreds, if not thousands of different cell types, all of which have overlapping but not identical functions. So what are some of the ways that we track what's going on with the immune system in the body? Flow cytometry is one of the techniques that we use. So you can take um, blood cells from a patient or even immune cells that are present in an organ, um, and you can label all of the cells with antibodies that are fluorescently tagged where each antibody has a different fluorescent tag. And so they're going to make a cell light up with these different colors based on what different proteins the cell is expressing. And then you run it through this machine called a flow cytometer, which um, uh, runs the cells through a very small column 
in which only one cell is moving through the column at any one time. And then as it moves through that very narrow column, it's hit by a bunch of lasers and the uh, fluorophores that are now attached to the cell will light up depending on how much of each protein that cell expresses. And when we integrate all that information, we can figure out not only how many different cell types there are in a particular sample, but what they're expressing and how they're behaving. And so we use that to try to understand this phenomenon that I mentioned before, which is how do T cells ramp up and then ramp down in response to an infectious agent. And one thing that a number of researchers realized pretty quickly is that T cells do a lot of what cancer cells and non-transformed cells do, which is that they respond to growth factor stimulation by engaging in nutrient uptake. So for a T cell to be activated, it needs to be, uh, it needs to um, bind a foreign signal that's presented on a particular molecule called an MHC molecule. And it also has to receive what's called co-stimulation, which is a way of telling the T cell that the signal it's seeing is dangerous. And a number of people many years ago, again, including our very own Craig Thompson, tried to figure out how these signals tell a T cell to start growing. And it turns out that the T cell receptor is a growth factor receptor, just like the insulin receptor is a growth factor receptor. And by using a number of techniques, including flow cytometry, Craig showed that when you activate a T cell through its T cell receptor, one of the things that you do is you change its metabolic behavior. So for example, he used an antibody that binds to the glucose transporter to show that it's only fully activated T cells that increase expression of that glucose transporter on the surface. So only when a T cell is stimulated, does it start taking up tons of glucose? And that's what you see on the bottom. The fully activated T cells are taking up lots of glucose. And interestingly, they are excreting almost all of it as lactate. So they're engaging in that same form of proliferative metabolism that I discussed for proliferating cells in a multicellular organism and cancer cells in which they are engaging in aerobic glycolysis in order to engage in anabolic metabolism so that they can build stuff and rapidly proliferate. And as I mentioned before, because a T cell is a non-transformed cell, it couples that growth signal to a differentiation signal so that the T cell doesn't grow out of control. Because like I mentioned, you want to be able to ramp up and then ramp down. And so as I mentioned, um, when the cell takes up tons of glucose, it will convert it into um, metabolic intermediates that it can use to make stuff like nucleotides and lipids, but it will also convert it to small molecules that then go into the nucleus and tell the cell to differentiate into a particular cell type. I'm running a little short on time, so I'm not gonna tell you about the assay that we, uh, that we use to measure this, but I'll just show you that if you look for whether those small metabolites, in this case, acetyl-CoA, have been attached to various parts of chromatin um, in T cells that have been stimulated, what you can see is that if you are differentiating a T cell into one type of cell type called an inflammatory Th1 cell, you see a lot of those acetyl-CoA's attached to um, the part of the DNA that tells the cell to make a cytokine associated with that cell type, interferon gamma. And if you tell the cell to be a different cell type, like a Th2 cell type, you'll see a lot of that acetyl-CoA attached to the um, gene that tells a cell to make a cytokine associated with the Th2 cell type. So just like in um, any other non-transformed cells, T cells respond to growth factor stimulation by engaging in aerobic glycolysis and also taking some of those metabolites and attaching them to chromatin to tell them what kind of cells they want to be. So you recall that I mentioned that it's really, really important for T cells to be able to ramp down because if you don't ramp T cells down, you start getting out of control and the T cells can destroy your own tissue. And so, you know, um, when, you know, 30 years ago or so, when a number of scientists, including like Jim Allison and Jeff Bluestone and Craig and others, were trying to figure out how T cells ramped down, they found some of these other receptors that were present on T cells. You may have heard of some of them called PD-1 and CTLA-4. And they started wondering, well, what are these different receptors doing? And are they helping T cells ramp down so that they don't destroy your own tissue? So if you want to think about different ways you could explore how a particular receptor affects a cell's function, there's a couple of different things you can do. 
One thing you can do is you can actually look for people who have germline mutations that remove the function of that molecule. So you could find, for example, a family that seems to have all of these autoimmune problems and you could sequence their genome and find, huh, they all seem to have like and transmit uh, mutations in this particular gene, for example, called CTLA-4. And then you can look and see what happens to them and say, oh, that's really interesting. And these patients who have these mutations in CTLA-4, their T cells seem to no longer be naive. They seem to be mostly activated. And we find T cells all over the place where they're not supposed to be, suggesting that maybe this molecule CTLA-4 is important for ramping down the immune response. And then you could do something like say, well, I can't do this in a person, but I could genetically modify a mouse. And this is something that people in the lab do routinely now is that they can, you know, even on the single cell level, manipulate gene expression in a single fertilized egg and then implant that fertilized egg into a parent mouse, which will then give rise to a, what we call a transgenic mouse. And so now you can generate a mouse that is otherwise normal, but just doesn't express this one molecule CTLA-4. And you can say, oh, does the same thing happen that we see in these patients? And indeed it does. If you look in mice that don't express this gene CTLA-4, they have abnormal T cell activation with T cells going everywhere and actually killing the mouse from tissue destruction. So it's really important for T cells to have these negative regulators to keep them from destroying the body. So how does this connect the immune system to cancer? Well, for essentially ever since cancer has been described, we've try been trying to figure out why your immune system can't recognize and get rid of your cancer. As I mentioned, your immune system and particularly your adaptive immune system develops to recognize theoretically anything that's foreign. So why wouldn't it recognize cancer? And for a long time, scientists discussed these two possibilities. One was that, well, maybe because tumors came from your own body, they look enough like yourself that your immune system doesn't recognize them. And that would have been a reasonable explanation, except for something called the Hellstrom paradox, which came from this uh, professor, Dr. Hellstrom, who had noted that if you actually look at tumors, you find lots of immune cells there. So it can't be that your tumor isn't sensed. In many cases, your tumor is sensed and your immune system is there, but it's not working. And uh, one scientist in particular named Steve Rosenberg at the uh, National Cancer Institute thought, well, maybe what we should just do is take those T cells out and culture them and grow them out and put them back into patients. Maybe they just need like a break from the tumor. And if you put them back into patients, they'll kill the tumor. And actually, in some isolated cases, that does seem to work. And that was first reported now over 30 years ago. Um, but unfortunately, in most cases, if you take those T cells that are standing down and you grow them out and you put them back into a patient, they still stand down. And we still didn't understand this problem. Why do T cells go into a tumor and then all of a sudden stop doing their job? Well, the answer relates back to that ramping down process that I mentioned to you before, right? Which is that T cells need to have a way to ramp down and shut themselves off. Well, around the same time that people like Craig and Jeff Bluestone and others were saying, hey, there are these interesting receptors on T cells that tell them to stand down. Jim Allison, another very famous immunologist said, well, maybe these T cells are abnormally being told to stand down in the context of a tumor when they shouldn't be. So he did a very simple experiment, which is that he took mice and he gave them tumors. And before he gave them tumors, he just gave an antibody to the mice that said, hey, like, don't let CTLA-4 work. Don't let this negative regulatory receptor work. And let's see what happens. And lo and behold, the mice who had been given the antibody that blocked this standing down signal rejected all the tumors. Um, and that was actually one of the first examples of a therapy being effective uh, against cancer in which the treatment actually didn't target the cancer, but targeted another part of your body's functioning. And for those of you who don't know, that's been the basis for you know, possibly the greatest paradigm shift we've seen in cancer therapy in the last 50 years, which is the advent of immunotherapy. And these are some pivotal trials run by our very own Jed Walchuk, the head of our immuno-oncology service. So this is an example. Uh, th these are what are called Kaplan-Meier survival curves of patients with melanoma. 
And so the, if you look at that gray curve, that's pretty much where we were at 10 years ago, which is that if you had metastatic melanoma, you had essentially a less than 5% chance of surviving even like two or a little more than two years. And what you can see in those sequential curves above them is that giving patients these uh, different what we call checkpoint inhibitors that block the signals that tell a T cell to stand down have remarkably changed the outcomes for these patients, including in some of these patients, you know, who just received only a few doses of these drugs, really like keeping them remission free for over five and now like almost 10 years. Um, so these have really been remarkable treatments um, uh, uh, for our patients. And just to link that back to metabolism, since I already told you that T cells, part of the way that they work is that when they get activated through their T cell receptor, they engage in aerobic glycolysis and start taking up tons of glucose so that they can proliferate. Is it possible that these negative regulatory molecules, these immune checkpoints also work by changing the metabolism of cells? And it turns out that that's actually true. So if you look at what these receptors like PD-1 and CTLA-4 actually do to cells, they don't really change the phenotype of the cells that much, and they don't really change um, their gene expression that much. But what they really do is they reduce the ability of those cells to take up glucose. And if you reduce the ability of T cells to take up glu glucose, they're not gonna be able to proliferate as much. And if they're not gonna be able to proliferate as much, you're not going to be able to make as many cells that are able to fight off cancer. So it turns out that these checkpoint inhibitors are really metabolic drugs. And that's a big part of why we think this intersection between metabolism and immunology is so important. So I know I only have a couple minutes left, so I'm just going to close with some outstanding areas because obviously for me as a scientist who works on immunology and metabolism, you know, we are very happy to see a lot of the landmark achievements that have happened um, that have helped us take care of patients with refractory cancers. But we know that there are, are many, many, many patients that we still have to help. And so we're very interested in why immunotherapy fails and doesn't work for many, if not most patients. And so many scientists, um, including many uh, at, at our, our own institution at MSK, have been studying the way that, it, that T cells become dysfunctional in tumors. And it turns out it's not just expression of like one or two immune checkpoints like PD-1 or CTLA-4. It's actually activation of an entire genome-wide gene expression program. And while initially the way we thought checkpoint inhibitors worked was if you look in this schematic in the upper left, you have naive T cells in the lymph node, they're being activated by tumor antigens, then they're getting activated and then they're going into a tumor and they're turning in this depiction orange and then red as they get progressively dysfunctional. The initial hypothesis was that like checkpoint blockade could kind of push them back from the ledge and make them less exhausted so that they could engage in their job. But that actually turns out not to be accurate at all. And it turns out that checkpoint blockade, if anything, does the opposite. So what checkpoint blockade does is it kind of like throws the gates open to your immune response. And it now says like, you know, if you were a cell that wasn't going to get activated before and progress through this sequence, now like go ahead, please progress through this sequence and get activated and then exhausted. And so you get this burst of immune activity when you treat patients with a checkpoint inhibitor. But there is this problem, which is that you have a pool of cells that you need to start with. And if you push all the cells forward in their natural trajectory, eventually you're going to run out of the initial pool of cells. And that initial pool of cells is usually a set of cells that look kind of stem cell-like. Remember I told you guys earlier in this lecture, if you're going to activate a cell to be able to proliferate, you need a growth factor stimulus, but also you need a cell that is still capable of self-renewal, that is capable of continuing to proliferate. And so a number of scientists identified these so-called progenitor T cells that are really important for being able to keep an immune response going for a long time. And what happens in patients who don't respond in, in many cases to immune checkpoint inhibitors is that they lose this ability to keep proliferating. And the reason I mentioned that is that that just so happens to be something that my lab's really interested in. So we were understand, really interested in this question. Why do T cells lose the capacity to proliferate as they uh, undergo this long-term immune response to cancer? So we just looked at all the small metabolites that were in cells as they were getting exhausted in this fashion. And we found something like really interesting, which is that all of the metabolites that were lost in those cells 
ended in this TP, meaning triphosphate. So they were all these nucleotide triphosphates that were being lost in these cells. So he said, huh, where do you make these nucleotide triphosphates that these exhausted T cells are no longer able to make them? And it turns out that they are um, their synthesis requires a number of phosphorylation steps. So you first make the nucleoside or the nucleoside monophosphate, and then you phosphorylate it twice, and then you get the nucleotide triphosphate. So this is like the CTP, GTP, um, TTP, UTP, and you put those together, and that's what helps you make um, uh, nucleotide strands so that you can make more DNA and you can proliferate. So this made sense. A cell that lost the ability to make these nucleotide triphosphates wouldn't be able to keep proliferating. And if you need ATP to make all those nucleotide triphosphates, maybe these exhausted T cells were losing their mitochondrial function. And that turns out to be the case. Um, and it turns out that if you give a therapy to metabolically resuscitate these cells, in this case, it's giving the T cells antioxidants, you can move these cells from what we call a terminally exhausted state where they can't proliferate anymore to a state where they now can proliferate. Um, and so this is yet another piece of evidence that um, the way that a T cell behaves metabolically is really fundamental to determining whether it can engage in a long-term anti-tumor immune response. So I'll just close by mentioning a few other aspects of outstanding questions in the field of tumor immunology that we're still trying to answer. Um, one is trying to help T cells overcome the odds. We know the odds are stacked against T cells within tumors. Tumors, as we mentioned, have all these mutations that tell them to take up nutrients continuously um, um, and without stopping. And so as a byproduct of that, what happens is that many tumors, and in particular in the middle of tumors, um, you have a depletion of a lot of nutrients that cells need to grow. That's not really a problem for tumors because tumors will just um, engage in different strategies to acquire whatever they need to keep growing. So if glucose is present, sure, they'll use glucose. If they run out of that, they'll use something else. They'll take up um, large proteins from the environment with something called macropinocytosis. In some cases, they'll actually eat up dead cells, a process known as entosis, and they'll break all those down and make micronutrients and use them to keep growing. But T cells actually won't do that. Non-transformed cells look at nutrient depletion much in the same way that yeast, like I mentioned in the beginning of uh, uh, this lecture, look at them, which is that it's an indication that you need to stand down, you need to sporulate, you need to stop. Um, and so what we see happening to a lot of immune cells and tumors is that they encounter these nutrient barriers and they stop while the tumors keep going. So one of the future directions that we need to take is to help T cells survive and function within these harsh environments where they would otherwise be told to stand down. And the final thing that I'll mention, just because it might have been something that you guys have heard about, is this idea of chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy. So I had mentioned before that there were two competing hypotheses for why the immune system can't recognize tumors. One was that there were, that the immune system, that the tumors were simply invisible to the immune system. And the other was this Hellstrom paradox, which was that there were T cells in the tumor, but they weren't functioning. Well, it turns out that there are plenty of tumors that truly are invisible. The immune system really doesn't see them. And what that means is that we didn't have an immune cell that could recognize something specific on the tumor. Well, genetic engineering has actually helped us overcome that problem. So it turns out that you can engineer special receptors called chimeric antigen receptors that will essentially let a T cell recognize anything you want. And so you can take a T cell out of a patient and genetically modify it, modify it to recognize a specific protein on a cancer cell, especially if it's on the extracellular surface, and infuse it back into the patients. And those T cells will then attack uh, the cancer cells expressing that protein. And that has been another landmark uh, step forward in our treatment of patients with cancer. This is an example of something called B cell ALL, which is a, a, a cancer that common, that is it's a relatively rare cancer, but it affects lots of young people. Um, and in those patients, particularly the ones who didn't respond to uh, first line chemotherapy, their prognosis was really dismal and CAR T cells have really changed the game for them. But at the end of the day, a CAR T cell is just another growth factor receptor. So the same problems that you have with T cells are the same problems that you have with CAR T cells. So just like regular T cells, they get exhausted. Just like regular T cells, the odds are stacked against them in the tumor microenvironment. And so they have a lot of difficulty persisting. So the same things that we are trying to do in regular T cells, we're trying to do those same things in CAR T cells. 
help them not get exhausted, help them survive longer so that they can mediate long-term remissions. So to conclude this last part, T-cell activation, proliferation, and differentiation are regulated by growth factor dependent changes in cellular metabolism. T-cell exhaustion limits anti-tumor immunity and is driven in large part by immune checkpoint driven suppression of glucose uptake and antigen dependent loss of mitochondrial function. And ongoing T-cell exhaustion may be driven by nutrient alterations in the tumor microenvironment. So I just uh, recently started my own lab at MSK, and I'm very thankful to the new members of my own lab. And I'm also very grateful to the organizers for inviting me to talk to you guys. And I'm very happy to talk with you now about any questions you have or going forward about any questions you have in metabolism or immunology. So I'll just stop sharing there. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Vardana. We do have a couple of questions. Um, uh, the first is from Justin. They ask, could the radioactive tagged glucose be used for a targeted immunotherapy, which uses the tagged glucose to only target a therapy at the malignant cancer cells, thus preventing any unintentional negative effects that would result from non-targeted therapy? Yeah. So Justin, that's a really, really interesting question. Um, the idea of attaching a toxic treatment to a specific targeting agent is a big area of interest in cancer therapy. Um, what we tend to actually use is something called antibody drug conjugates. The problem with attaching that to glucose is, you know, as we mentioned, all cells that need to grow in your body take up glucose for that purpose. So if you targeted a really toxic agent to it, you would certainly kill a bunch of cancer cells, but you would also kill like any other cell in your body trying to grow. And unfortunately, it turns out that cancer cells, like I mentioned at the end of my talk, are way better at using all types of other stuff. And so eventually what would happen is the cancer would use other stuff to grow. And uh, meanwhile, like all your immune cells would be killed. But the idea of delivering specific therapies to different cells using some type of targeting agent um, is an active area of exploration. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Verdana. The next question goes um, to Peter. They ask, what determines the specific B and T cells that are released? Yeah, so that's a really, uh, that's a really good question. So, and it, that's a complex, uh, uh, it's a complex question with a lot of potential different answers. So, you know, the way that B cells and T cells are generated is if, if you think about it, if you want to make a potential T cell that recognizes everything in existence, but doesn't destroy you, uh, probably the most ingenious solution to this that your body does is it just says, well, let's just make every theoretical receptor that we can think of. And then let's test those cells against a panel of proteins that we know are expressed in your own body. And if your T cells or your B cells recognize them, they'll be removed. And so that's essentially what happens in the thymus in particular to T cells. So you generate theoretically a T cell to recognize any foreign thing in your body, or at least 10 to the ninth different things in your body. And then those T cells move through the thymus and the thymus expresses as many things as it can that your own body expresses. And if a T cell recognizes that, uh, it gets deleted. And then the remaining T cells go into your body and start moving around, like surveilling your body, living in your lymph nodes. And when they see a specific foreign peptide that matches their receptor, that's when they get activated. Great. And our last question um, is, what prevents an immune autoimmune response when the checkpoint inhibitors are introduced? Yeah, so fantastic, fantastic question. Um, and uh, the simplest way to answer that is um, nothing. So so in fact, when the first of these checkpoint inhibitors was used, uh, the antibody against uh, CTLA-4, pretty quickly we started seeing that a lot of patients did get autoimmune um, uh, manifestations. So we had patients with T cells attacking their colon, attacking their liver, attacking you know parts of their brain even. Um, and so those autoimmune compl complications are you know, something that we really have to deal with with any therapy that essentially in a non-specific way just says whatever the threshold was for a T cell to think that this is foreign, let's make that threshold lower. And so many, many scientists are trying to figure out what discriminates a T cell that might, in whom the threshold might be lower to recognize cancer from a T cell 
for whom the threshold might be lowered to recognize part of your own body. How much of that is driven by the signal itself? How much of that is driven by who is presenting the, the signal? Um, and how much of that is de uh, determined by like the patient? So uh, those are all major active area of interest, but I think it really highlights the fact that, you know, when you have something as powerful as your immune system that can both, you know, kill a foreign invader, but also kill you, anytime you decide to mess with nature and tip the scales in one direction or another, you know, you're going to have to deal with some friendly fire and figure out a way to neutralize it. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Verdana, for your talk today. Um, it was very informative, and I'd like to thank all of our attendees for joining. Um, our next talk is scheduled next Wednesday with Dr. Melissa Murray, so we welcome you all to join us well. Thank you again, Dr. Verdana, and you have a great rest of the day, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everybody.